Yeah, first again, uh, thanks again so much to, to Zönke for putting this whole event together. Uh, it's been quite ama amazing for me and for our team to meet so many in this community that are working on kind of these big issue topics um, in science. Um, maybe a little bit of background to me first, like as also more and more people just start coming back from lunch. Um, so my background is originally not in science, but in economics. Uh, I studied at the uh, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland and there first kind of got in touch with, um, with Bitcoin and, and Dogecoin, interestingly enough, in early, um, early 2013. Uh, and then kind of went through different industries. Um, but just after high school, I got really fascinated with the idea of uh, pharmaceutical economics and how the pharmaceutical system that we've built up today and that has kind of developed over the past uh, almost 80 years um, works from a macroeconomic perspective. Um, and then kind of one of the guiding questions that I started coming up for me again over the past year is like, how can we use these really new interesting um, crypto economic designs to change uh, industries uh, on a massive scale? Um, so after graduating, I worked in uh, South Africa for a while, worked on identity systems. Um, they started a company called uh, Linen Labs, which is today developing this protocol. Uh, and also worked at a company called Consensus, um, which is one of the largest software development companies in, in blockchain. Um, so my background is like I come from a tech, really from a tech product development and economics background. Uh, and it's been a really fascinating journey for me to dive really deeply into the scientific community um, and, and learn about all of the different aspects of molecular biology, chemical engineering. Um, yeah, cool. So just some background. Um, so what is, the, what is the big overarching topic that we want to look at today? Or maybe a quick intro on the agenda. Uh, we're going to look at what are the general problems that we find with intellectual property and how those problems manifest specifically in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, then we're going to look at how can we actually tackle these problems with token engineering. So there's been quite a bit of talk from earlier, um, um, earlier speakers today around this, this overarching topic of token engineering. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a brief intro to, to Molecule, um, just from a high-level perspective, what are our goals? Um, then we want to intro uh, curation markets, using curation markets, one of these crypto economic designs for IP. We're going to look at a specific concept called token bonding curves, so really diving a bit deeply in one new design model and how we can use that, um, how we combine that with crypto kitties, actually. Um, and then we look at curation markets in pharma and some of the core architecture and the challenges that we're, that we're dealing with in that concept. Cool. Um, so a large part of pharmaceutical or like of general innovation is based on patents. Um, so this was the first patent that was ever issued. Um, you can't see it on there, but take a guess how old it is. Does anyone know when the first patent was ever issued? Yeah, okay, someone read it. Cool. So it was in, in the United States in 1790. This is when we kind of started with the legal system around patents. This particular patent was issued for a production mechanism for potash, which was used in, in fertilizers. Um, and it was actually underwritten by George Washington, the president at the time. Um, but there's been extremely little innovation in how we actually distribute and deal with patents. Um, and today, there's a lot of problems with how patents work. So patents are justified in the way that they allow people to recuperate investments into technology and science. But how, they, how that recuperation that works is uh, it creates a monopoly. Um, and that monopoly leads to, we've seen this like uh, with, leads to patent trolls. It leads to price gouging on consumers. So these extremely high prices for, for drugs um, that, we, that we see in certain economies. Uh, and it also leads to non, a non-collaborative scientific ecosystem. So because patents are now being developed in secret, because everyone is trying to create a monopoly, that doesn't actually create an, an environment that incentivizes open source information sharing. Um, so that's kind of one of the root big problems that we see with, with IP. Uh, and this, this system has hardly evolved um, over, over the years. It's just gotten more and more legally complex, but the underlying economics of it hasn't changed. A patent is a monopoly enforced by the violence of the state, so to speak. Um, what are the big problems in pharma at the same time? Um, so current IP development and research and development in big pharma companies is closed source and intransparent. One of the biggest problems with intransparency is the negative data problem, which probably many of you know from other scientific areas. There's no incentive to publish negative data. Um, because if I'm a pharma company and I commission a study, 
to be uh, for someone to create about my drug if it's if if this drug is positive or not. If the if the outcome is negative, I have no incentive to publish that because why should I tell people I'm developing a bad drug? Um, uh, to that, then it's non-collaborative by nature. So each company has to work by themselves, and then to create these monopolies. And the monopoly is essentially almost distributed between 10 major pharma companies across the globe, which have collectively have the financial power to take drugs to market. Um, pharma today, and this has been said over the past 10 years, is in an innovation crisis. Um, it's extremely resource intensive. The average cost to bring any drug to market today is $2.5 billion. So if you, if you go to a hospital and you get a drug there, prescribed by your doctor, the cost of bringing that to market was $2.5 billion on average. Um, it's very risky. Only about 1% of compounds that ever enter clinical studies actually make it to market. Um, so you have an extremely high attrition rate. It's very slow. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a drug. And, and on top of that, now the, uh, the return for R&D, so we're investing these billions of dollars, and the return is 3.2%. Um, that, that's from a statistic that came out last year. Um, and, and the reason for that is, in my opinion, is because it's driven by these research monopolies, and, it, it, and it's, it's non-open source. Um, on, on top of that, uh, because the whole way the system works, it's revenue-driven innovation, so the drugs that pharmaceutical companies want to bring to market um, need to make revenue. Uh, and there was a very interesting article by Goldman Sachs that came out earlier this year um, titled, Is Curing Patients a Sustainable Business Model? It's not. <laughs> Obviously, for if you're operating a giant company, you need to you need to have consumers for the drugs that you create. Um, and historically, we've seen uh, we've seen that some of the drugs that pharma companies bring to market actually lead to public health crises. Uh, one of the best recent examples is the opioid crisis, prescription opioids in the U.S., which per annum kill 72,000 people in the United States. Uh, and this is by drugs that are being brought to market and and sold by pharma. Uh, and it's not, it's like, it's not that those drugs are inherently bad, but if we could bring better drugs to market that would create less consumers, that would be a bad thing for revenue. Um, and w one example there to bring is like, let's say we had a, a painkiller that people only had to take once every two weeks, and it was non-addictive, and it was very cheap to produce, yay, but that would be a, a terrible drug to bring to market. Um, and so if we look at the innovation cycle that, that pharma creates, like essentially those 10 companies can control what, what comes to market collectively. Um, and, and I think that's a problem. Like, I think that's a huge problem if you think that the underlying goal here is to, like, to make p give healthier lives to people and prolong people's lives. Um, so what is Molecule Protocol? A brief intro. Molecule is an open source ecosystem to incentivize decentralized research and development in compounds and drugs. So primary driver, how can we incentivize the decentralized development of these things? Um, secondly, it's a market-making platform for price discovery and funding of chemical IP to crowdsource the most valuable compounds for humankind. Now just if you think back a little bit, if you have an open source system, people should, would allocate rationally to the drugs that make the most sense, um, which currently isn't the case because it's closed. Um, so at its core, the goals of the protocol are to distribute cost, risk, and the ownership of intellectual property. Um, because all that, that drug development is essentially is creating data about whether a specific compound is effective or not in the, in the human body or can do a specific thing. It's just data creation about IP that belongs to someone. And then the regulator approves the drug. Um, uh, so what we want to move to is incentivize collaboration, um, openness and, and competition in this market, and much more economic efficiency. Uh, and ultimately, what we're trying to build is an ecosystem that everyone can actually benefit from. So from the patients that take these drugs, um, to the researchers that produce them, um, to investors that invest in pharma companies, to the pharma companies themselves, because as we've just seen, like, the numbers are pretty horrific if you think about how much innovation they produce with these giant construct constructs. Um, so. It sounds too good to be true. It's like we create, we want to create a win-win ecosystem, um, but we actually think we've found a way uh, to potentially make that possible. Um, and so we started by asking, like, by you applying mechanism design, 
uh, which is an engineering practice that's widely used in across a bunch of different fields, but is now really popping up in the field of crypto economics. And what you kind of do is you start by asking what are the principal stakeholders in an ecosystem like this. Uh, and from our side, it's, it's pretty simple. It's IP creators. So IP creators would be biotech companies, a researcher that discovers a new compound, or even a large-scale pharma company. It's someone who creates a new thing. Um, then it's data producers, so people who produce data about whether a drug is effective or not, or whether a chemical compound can achieve what it, what it, what, what it says what it might potentially do. Then you have the regulators and verifiers, which need to make sure that the data submitted about the IP is, is good and whether it, it like serves the purpose and is not harmful to people. Then you have the consumers, which, which take drugs at the end of the day, uh, which need cures for, for all kinds of various diseases. And then you have the investors, which make the whole funding uh, situation possible that we've talked about so much today. Uh, so the key engineering question for us were what, what do these stakeholders want? What behavior should they have? And how can we change that behavior using uh, incentive design? Um, how do we get stakeholders to behave differently? Dimi said it quite nicely yesterday. It's like blockchain has a superpower to like incentivize behavior. Uh, and we do that using a principle called crypto economics more broadly, but you can only engineer, you can only create economics through engineering in this, in this principle. Um, so one of the subsets here is curation markets, which is a new crypto economic principle primitive that's kind of come up over the last two years. It's, it's still fairly new. There's a lot of experimentation happening. The backgrounds of curation markets actually for trading, um, it was uh, pioneered by someone called Simon de la Ruvia to trade memes. So funny pictures on the internet. Um, and how do, we, how do we curate the most, the funniest pictures? Uh, and actually have people investing in those pictures. But the background is now why don't we curate the best the best valuable compounds. I mean, have people invest in those compounds. Um, so this is one of the building blocks. And something important to note, these are still experiments and not blueprints for, um, for design. So just briefly, what is, um, what is the concept of token engineering? Uh, so token engineering is a combination of systems and mechanism design plus software engineering patterns. Uh, it's uh, the rigorous design analysis and verification of systems like an industry. Um, and then assisted by tools that reconcile theory with practice. Um, it's also a, a responsibility. So engineering, as an engineer who has to build a bridge, he, an engineer that builds a bridge is ethically responsible for building a good bridge that doesn't collapse. Uh, we unfortunately saw some of that recently, I think, in Italy. Um, but so it's, it's, you need to be ethically conscious when building and engineering these systems. Um, and something important, it's not token economics. So token economics is like how might, might these tokens behave and maybe make investors money. Token engineering is about how do we actually build the system that, that can allow these new interactions. Um, cool. What are curation markets? Curation markets are, so this is a quote from Sam de la Rube, they reduce information asymmetry in the market through the usage of novel skin-in-the-game signals generated through the use of tokenized crypto-economic incentive schemes. <laughs> okay. Long phrase, but it's basically just saying put your money where your mouth is. And, and have the market kind of curate information uh, about what might be valuable and what's, what's less valuable. We see something like this in the stock market today, people putting in making investments, um, but we, there's much more, ins much more efficient ways to design these systems. Um, so basically, you put your money where your mouth is, you stake value or attention, it could even be reputation, into markets they will believe will be more valuable. Uh, and the market's currency now becomes a proxy for attention. That means the more stake is allocated in something, the more, um, the more we can see collectively that people are paying attention to it. In the, in the context of a compound, this would literally be, imagine you had tens of thousands of investable compounds, and now we can actually see as soon as market activity starts happening um, in any of them. And early rewarders are adopted for, for, for early, yeah, for getting in early. Um, this is done using, uh, most easily done using something called a token bonding contract. Um, it's a fairly simple concept once you wrap your head around it. It's a smart contract. It can be deployed in various blockchains, um, most commonly on Ethereum. It's a smart contract that accepts collateral, so dollars, or other digital assets in exchange for tokens of its denomination. So dollar goes in, token comes out. Token goes in, dollar comes out. And, and that is essentially, that relationship is governed by, um, by a curve. So that's one example of what a curve could look like. You have the price and the supply. It's, it's a simple supply curve. Uh, so you have to imagine as more people start buying in early into the asset, they are proportionally rewarded for adopting the asset early. Um, but what this now essentially is, it's an, it's an automated, it's an automated market mechanism. 
um, where we can trade attention in a specific asset. Uh, in this example, this is a quadratic curve. Um, essentially, how you, how you would code this contract is, is totally up to the creator, but you obviously you need to code it in a way that would make, um, w make economic sense. Uh, something that's really important, this is not an issuing or an ICO because no one gets the money in the contract. The contract basically, people allocate collateral in what they think makes sense, and the contract holds that collateral and issues them tokens back, and they can sell back and forth to the contract at any time. Um, yeah, if you're interested in these concepts more broadly, I think they, have a, they could have a host of applications in this ecosystem. Um, some of the best work, as I said, is from Simon de la Ruvia, um, but if you Google token bonding curves, there's a host of, um, host of good articles um, on by now. Uh, okay, so then a second really interesting concept that has popped up in the, in the crypto space uh, are these cute furry creatures. Um, how, many, how many of you know what a crypto kitty is, more or less? Okay, okay, so actually most of the audience, great. Um, so crypto kitties are essentially just our digital cats. They're created using a system called non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible token basically just means you can't divide it. It's like a singular entity. Uh, and now, um, what it is on the other side, you so you have this token and you attach it to a link to IPFS, which is then the picture of the cat, and that's the whole magic. Um, but people got super excited about this. It actually to the point where the whole Ethereum blockchain slowed down significantly, <laughs> and no one else could use it because everyone was trading these these cats. It, it was a hype, but I think there's a l much deeper thing here, um, which is namely like why don't we attach patents to these things? Um, so IP is usually based on patents and it's proprietary. T data timestamp a timestamp claim we can do that pretty easily so what we can do we take the information the data and a patent and we attach it to an nft um but what we then and, and like so instead of having a crypto kitty you could have a fusion reactor design attached or or a molecule uh, and what we then do we combine these two principles so this is where token engineering gets fun we now say this this nft is owned by this token bonding curve um, and what now means, now we can actually trade shares using this market mechanism in a crypto kitty or in a patent for a molecule or a fusion reactor. Uh, I'm sure there's many other use cases to, to think of. Um, and we can trade attention in, like, in kind of this combination that we've made. Um, wait, I want to get to this first. So in our context, if you think about this now, it's like you, if w with a digital cat, you own the digital cat. But now, if you give the ownership of the cat or, or the patent away to a smart contract, you don't own it anymore. And, but now no one owns it. And, and so this was something for me to wrap my head around. And Trent McConaughey, who's based in Berlin and founded the Ocean Protocol, has done a lot of thinking about this. It's like assets starting to own themselves. If no one owns the compound anymore because we've put it in this market and now people trade shares in that compound, it, they kind of start owning themselves. And so it's a conceptual thing. But yeah, they, they essentially can own themselves. Um, and so what does this enable for, uh, for s scientists more broadly? Or like how can you use this as a funding mechanism? Because I know funding is a, is a big topic in this community. Um, so now using these token bonding curves, we can have a price discovery and market making mechanism. We can have a liquidity mechanism. So whoever creates the curve can allocate himself, um, can allocate himself a small share of the initial market. Uh, and now once there's a tension in whatever research or whatever Kanban, for example, is developing, that provides a way to get liquidity because that person can now send back tokens to the contract to get out liquidity. Um, so funding can be obtained back by selling tokens to the market. And it's a model that actually still works with traditional equity financing. So now instead of saying, I own, uh, I own this whole patent in a monopoly, uh, you can say, I own 30% of this market that is gaining more and more attention. Um, yeah, so this enables a whole, this could enable a whole bunch of things, namely, but specifically offloading IP and getting attention for IP and getting liquidity for that IP. Uh, and no one can own IP fully anymore or, or capitalize on it. Um, what it also does, and this is what I find really interesting, it incentivizes open source data publishing. Because if I know, let's say I'm a researcher and I can purchase shares in a compound or maybe even in a resource that I'm interested in, I can buy myself into this market. And now if I create positive data about it or even negative data, that will influence the market. So now I have a way to get involved in the research about projects, and, and I'm incentivized to publish, to publish data about it. Um, and yeah, sorry, we had that. And so 
how, how, how is this applicable with innovation in generally or with drug development? Like IP and ideas generally go through this long like innovation cycle. And the innovation cycle, if you put that over drug development, you have the discovery stage where you have potentially thousands of different compounds. And then you have preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three, and then the approval of a drug. That exact process is, is essentially just an innovation process of creating a funnel and narrowing down things that, um, uh, that have the biggest potential. And how this is currently done is, is centralized within companies. Obviously, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. But if you curate that information from the crowd and if you open source that information, uh, we think that could lead to, yeah, to, to a complete new ecosystem and industry, um, specifically in the, in the, in the chemical industry. Um, people have asked us, like, isn't this more broadly applicable? I think it is. So I think it's a very interesting concept. Um, but, and like, yeah. Please, please go on and explore. We need more people um, experimenting with these ideas. Um, so, but one big question is how do we actually map innovation? Um, and there's something called, it's we, so we are looking at implementing this using sigmoid curves, which is an S-shaped curve, and it's best suited for markets that stabilize after a certain um, growth point. Um, and so let's, let's just assume, and this is more like, a, like of an experiment, let's assume we mapped, we mapped open innovation in pharma using a sigmoid curve like this, and what you would have is basically you would have people buying in, selling in and out of the market all along the curve, contributing capital uh, and, and enabling people to get funding. Um, we kind of just discussed this before, like what does it mean for the IP creator? So an IP creator has, uh, can set himself an initial creator stake in a market. Um, and at a later point, once people start staking attention and value into it, um, he can sell a part of his stake, basically diluting himself further to get funding out of the market. Um, yeah. Uh, and so what is the, how are we applying this? Uh, I just want to walk you through like a very simplified user flow um, of like how would this actually all be possible in the real world because it can seem, it can seem a little bit daunting. Um, so what you do is you have a chemical patent as a researcher and you move that patent into a structure called uh, a patent investment trust so now you already say, I don't own it anymore, the trust owns it. And then you attach that patent data, so the marker structure of a compound, to a non-fungible token. Um, the trust then creates a legal contract that says our assets are now being managed by this specific token. Um, and then you set the owner address of that non-fungible token to the bonding curve. Um, and then you would set a creator stake. So the trust would now receive a certain amount of, of tokens because it, it created the IP and it now relinquishes the ownership of it. Uh, and then from that point onwards, essentially, you've created an open source, open market for anyone to start buying in and out of that, that asset. Um, and uh, let's say everything goes well. Upon w once FDA approval comes through, the drug actually goes to market. All of the token holders who purchase shares and attention in this market um, can now be paid out by the trust, for example, in royalties. So if a company then comes along and says, we now want to produce this, they need to license it from the trust and pay royalties to the trust. The trust can recompensate those token holders. Uh, I think we had a great legal talk earlier. So this is, uh, this is a security token. We're not talking here about like, like, like essentially we're, owning, we're, we're issuing ownership in, in intellectual property. Um, but we're creating a huge distribution of that. Um, yeah, these are some of the core components. So we have an access layer of how people can actually get into the protocol. Um, then compounds need to be approved. So you can't just put anything on there. Like, you need to we, like it needs to be verified that you are the actual owner of this IP, um, that it's been placed into the trust. Uh, so it's not like people can put all their IP on this tomorrow, like there needs to be a process for in order for the whole system to work because otherwise you're dabbling in these legal gray areas. Um, and then you have an NFT factory that creates these NFTs. Um, then you create a compound market and ideally in the end, the, the tokens that get issued by the compound contract are moved into a production contract um, where you can then talk about license rights uh, or that ultimately then also depends on how the actual drug um, will go to market. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Doge. I think any, any crypto or blockchain um, presentation always needs to have a Doge. Um, but there is a very high level of complexity that we're dealing here and a lot of math involved in setting up these curves in a, cor in a correct way. Something that is really cool, though, is 
Um, there's uh, probably 80 years of data about producing compounds, about valuation around patents, around what these markets could, could, could grow to like, and what the ultimate prices of the drugs will be. So it's not like we're dabbling in a completely unknown field with, um, yeah, with economics that are not known. Uh, but yeah, we still need a lot of economic modeling. Um, one thing I think that we really want to figure out, so this is a pure IP funding model. What we haven't taken in this yet is like, how can we get grant systems in there um, for, yeah, for like, for, for rare diseases, for example, um, uh, or for, for drugs that are, uh, like for diseases that are not, uh, where there's no big industry incentive to treat these. Um, the great thing about this, though, with an open market structure like this, like anyone can now come in. If you, if you know someone who has a rare disease or you've been afflicted by someone in your family, like you can actually get involved in these markets. Uh, you can invest. You can say, I'm allocating capital to something that I think should be researched. So it's a democratization of, of scientific development for pharma. Um, there is governance mechanisms to figure out, like once the compound comes to market, how, like how do you actually structure governance around this? Around, around managing the IP, there needs to be a board and a trust, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of legal complexity is still to figure out. Um, but as I said, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. We can actually, something that we realized as we started building this out, there's a lot of existing market structures that we can mirror that exist today. So there's a, there's a concept, for example, called, called royalty funds. So these are funds that purely invest in patents to get royalty payments from them. And so we, we're getting into this more and more and realizing, hey, there's all these existing structures. Um, but using a, using a token engineered systems, we can make these structures much more um, efficient. Um, cool, so maybe just to quickly, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Am I still good? Okay, cool. Um, where, we are, where are we today? So this protocol is being developed by, um, by our development company, which is Lindemax AG, uh, based in Switzerland. Um, ultimately, the whole ecosystem and the open source IP will be managed by uh, a nonprofit foundation in Switzerland which will oversee the project's long-term research, um, funding, and, and development. We're currently about a 10-person team working, working on this. Uh, we have a team of five developers. Uh, we're, onboarding, uh, we're onboarding different advisors. Um, we have a lot of the blockchain architecture built out. And once we did that, we basically realized, wait, 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 before we go deeper into this area, into the token engineering and, and incentive design, we need to build a user interface and like, actually figure out how people will interact with this. If our assumptions are correct, what these markets are going to look like. Um, so that's one really big focus for us now. Uh, and then uh, building a lot of partnerships with different academic institutions, uh, with the industry, with, uh, with think tanks. Um, yeah, to really start getting a lot of feedback on, on the big vision that we're, um, that we're creating. Um, yeah, what do we need to make this a reality? Um, you. Uh, so I've met a lot of amazing uh, scientists here from all different fields. Um, working with academic institutions, having experience in pharma. Um, yeah, so we, wanna, we really want to build up these relationships at this point. We see this as an, as, an, as an ecosystem. Like, we're not developing, we're developing this right now as a company, but everything will ultimately be managed by, by a foundation. And there we need a lot of buy-in and support um, because this is a system that will only work, as with many blockchain systems, if if all participants are incentivized and, and feel, feel that this really benefits them. Um, and this is one big challenge I think that we've had with like, or that we've already seen talking with pharma companies, that they're very quickly interested, who else are we talking to? Uh, and they, they kind of wanna, yeah, like it's, it sends negative signals to the market if you affiliate yourself too strongly with, with, with single players. Um, yeah, we're looking for advisors, team members, collaborators, anyone who wants to brainstorm with us around this, people specifically with background in patent law, pharma, biotech, obviously. Uh, and we really want to build a community around um, open source IP in science um, because there's a large field here that we can, we can figure out. Uh, so join our discussion on Telegram, Slack, connect with our team. Um, yeah, and I'd love to, maybe if some of you didn't understand some of the concepts yet that I explained earlier, I kind of went through maybe too quickly. Like, I think we maybe still have time for, um, for questions, but yeah.
you would need the patent first, but now it's it, the patent itself becomes open source in a way because you now have multi you can have any stakeholder buying into the patent and the creator of the patent doesn't own it anymore. So the creator says, have let, let, let society decide, let the market decide what this is worth. Um, and that then incentivizes open source data creation about that patent. Do you want to follow up? I'm not sure I agree with you. But okay. Yeah, but you can buy you can buy fractional ownership in it, which is to completely impossible today. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so, how um, do the token holders um, decide on whether to and uh, under which conditions to license uh, the patent? Yeah. Uh, good question. So, um, one way that we've thought about doing this is that there is a board in the trust. So remember that th remember this this trust might be super inactive if someone if if it's a market that never gets traded a lot of patents never find a use in the world, um, but if if there is a lot of market activity in that in that trust initially you would probably define uh, with certain token holderships you might have a board seat in the trust which means because you're a big stakeholder in this specific patent um, you would then have a board in the trust and ultimately if a drug comes to market or if a chemical finds a um, finds an industry use that trust board because they're now they now have ownership over a lot of assets and it's a big thing they would then decide on how to license it um, yeah Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask about the bonding curve yeah. when, once it's set is there a possibility to change it and yeah. also what happens does it just at the end does it continue or can you like shut it yeah. at some point. So there's, <coughs> from an open perspective, there's different models to implement it. So some, some people have been experimenting with infinite bonding curves. So technically, if the, if the interest in something is infinite, then it just gives, keeps on forever. Our model is using like a finite token supply. So at some point, the curve finishes, and then it's issued all of its tokens. And if then the, the demand for that thing is higher, those tokens will be traded on secondary markets. Um, yeah, so then the token becomes freely tradable. Uh, what what the what the bonding curve basically acts as is an is an early stage price discovery mechanism. You could also say we're only having this bonding curve until uh, we get approval for preclinical studies, or until we get approval for clinical studies, and then we evaluate the whole market size, um, because the information that emerges with that might completely change the outcome. Uh, and so then you actually work in in like different different funding stages, where after an initial stage, you might then say, cool, now we're redefining. We're redefining what this market looks like. Yeah. Um, very nice concept and ideas, uh, but I would like to know: Have you made any kind of a research about how the industry is open to those ideas? Because the, the, <laughs> the that industry is known to be very conservative and very yeah. uh, closed, as you probably said. Also. Yeah. Uh, did you make any uh, to talk to people about? Uh, would there be any openness about to yeah. even to get started? Or absolutely. So from re from researchers that so we talk to researchers that create IP, and one big problem that they have is, and uh, within five years, uh, a, a department where a researcher is working, or even an individual, might have created five to ten to fifteen patents, but he only has he only has time and funding to look at one of them and maybe one of them actually turns into a company. So you have all this IP sitting around, so that's one big use case for them. Um, so research is from a funding perspective, because now they can say, cool, I'll put it on there, because I know I'm not gonna develop this, and it, I don't have the time, but now I have liquidity to get, to get funding out of those markets. And I can, I can give those IP, uh, I can leave that IP to, to be developed by the market um, in whoever finds value in it. Um, and your second question was, from a, from a pharma perspective, Pharma, as a whole, knows that it has a deep innovation problem, and those that those problems are like are structural, I think macroeconomic problems. Um, so the response that we've had is is positive. Uh, I think it's for them. It takes a lot of uh, well, it takes a lot of talking to understand how how structurally this may change their market and what we're trying to do. Um, but overall, the response has been very positive, specifically from research that are saying, look, if you can help us get funding through this mechanism, and 
allow us to offload our IP. The same for biotech companies. Biotech companies that have done an IPO often, only, often have multiple patents, but they only have time to take one drug to market. Um, so what we see in this as well is really a system to incentivize the unleashing of, um, uh, of pharmaceutical IP that, that isn't being developed. The same, one last thing, the same way for large pharmaceutical companies who only have so much funding to take individual compounds through markets but are sitting on a big pile of IP that they essentially might not be monetizing. So what they can use the protocol for is to, because they know how much has been invested and they have a good sense of what they value this IP to be. And if you, create an, if you allow them to create an open source market for it, um, that actually create liquidity f creates liquidity for them. And ultimately it's good for them because they can put those assets on their balance sheet, which is good for their stock price um, to, like to, to turn it over. Yeah, I've, I, I, d I really love this project. It's cool. I would like to see it for more things than just molecules, right? Just molecule in parasynthesis. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so one thing, so our focus is really on chemical, chemical IP because it's deterministic yeah. um, in terms of what, it, what chemicals do, what chemical structures yeah. can do. Uh, but I think this is applicable in a lot more fields. Yeah. Uh, I've realized from building startups and from working at startups that like, pick your market and, and do that well. And we, we think this is a market that we can yeah. solve an enormous amount of, amount of problems in. Um, and I think each of those, each market is unique, um, is unique as well. But I could see these same principles, and that's why I try to help it, keep it a bit general, these same principles being used in a wide variety of, of applications potentially. Yeah. I mean, we brainstormed about it, like if we completely make it independent from patents and IP, as in the, in the, in the traditional yeah. way, and then more yeah. go more to meme markets, that say like we have like this idea and you can uh, invest in this idea and this crazy new concept that I'm like doing research on, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe this would be a way of like having the meme markets effect for a research idea to incentivize early ideas very early on, yeah? Yeah. And investing in it. I think ultimately if, if systems like this take off, it could replace, because the patent in this whole system is just a legal structure to make it work in the existing system. Like, I mean, ultimately, this could lead completely away to why do we need patents in the first place? Because we can timestamp it and we can create a verifiable market that is, that is yeah, that anyone can invest in and contribute to, to an idea. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot again. Cool. Great presentation. Thanks, everyone. Um. <laughs>